Metis, um, and then I'll turn the floor over to Daniel and, and PyData, okay? All right, so then real quickly again, I wanted to welcome everyone to Metis. I want to welcome everyone that's here and that's watching us on the live stream. Um, before we get started, quick question by show of hands, can you tell me how many people here have heard of Metis? Okay, so a number of people. All right. Um, and for those of you on the live stream as well, well real quickly, what, what we are is Metis is we are a data science educator. We're a data science educator that's been operating since 2014. We started in New York City, after which we expanded out to San Francisco. We started with our first cohort here in Chicago in January of 2017. Um, next week we're starting our fifth cohort here in Chicago. Um, and we're also out in Seattle as well. How do we do data science education? We do it in a couple of ways. First, we have our intense boot camps. These are three months boot camps done here on site um, where you're working Monday through Friday with two senior data scientists. It's a project-based boot camp. You're working on five project deliverables. Uh, that's going on all four of our campuses. We also have our professional development courses. These are going to be courses that are done um, after the work hours, so starting at 6.30 on our campuses as well, um, on, on our different campuses from intro to data science, machine learning, um, courses that are happening on site as well. We also have our live online, which we just recently launched. So these are going to be our courses that are happening online and 100% live. Um, the fourth way that we do data science education is that we do corporate training. So we do send out our senior data scientists from to different places within the United States and, and throughout the world. So if any of these four things would be of interest to you, anyone that's here tonight, I, I'll be around. My name is Nathan. Uh, I'm the program manager here in Chicago. I'll be around after the event. We can talk about that then. Um, or for those of you that are online, if you have any questions, I'll be in the chat momentarily. Um, you can ask away there. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Daniel from PyData, and we'll get this started. Right. Thanks, Nathan. Thank you. All right, so it's my pleasure to introduce Danny Malter, uh, who's giving the presentation today, um, and just give a little bit of his background. I think one of the things that really is a hallmark of a data enthusiast is having a diversity of interests and a diversity of curiosities, and that really comes out from Danny's background, uh, from being pre-med all the way up to actually being an author for uh, ML or Major League Baseball articles. Um, so a lot of diversity, and it also came out when he reached out to PyData about potentially uh, presenting where he pitched several ideas and this is a, like this is one of his many good ideas that he wanted to potentially share with us and so we're really excited about that. Uh, throughout this diverse background Danny ultimately I think it seems like he started to sink his teeth into uh, data enthusiasm and data anal analytics um, at, at a company called C Engage Learning where he was a data analyst looking at web analytics. Ultimately he built up his career there becoming a business insights analytics analyst and simultaneous to do to that he was also pursuing a master's in predictive analytics at DePaul. That ultimately led him to then becoming a data scientist at Hyatt where he seems to get to explore many really interesting questions whether it's predicting lifetime value or looking at where people are going to go rent a hotel or where you should put a hotel. Lots of interesting problems. It's the hallmark of data. It's so cool. Um, and then from there, he's then continued his trajectory up so that he's now also working on education and consulting. So if you're looking at getting some insights from him and maybe bringing him on for his consulting powers, then you can also reach out to him. But with that, I'd like to just let him take it away and talk to us about medical imaging and how we could potentially use TensorFlow and deep learning to uh, yeah. understand that. Thanks, Daniel. Um, so today's talk is going to focus on the second annual Kaggle Data Science Bowl. So just to start, has anybody done this competition before? No. Okay. That's good on your part because it was stressful. Um, <laughs> so yeah, as Daniel mentioned, you know, we've been in contact now probably since early in the summer through a mutual connection and never got my talk going, never found time for it. So this has been a long time in the making. but. Um, at the time, I was, it was something, you know, oh yeah, I could easily make a talk, and then I realized, I put some notes together on this uh, casual competition and realized that you can't really teach this all in one night, but it was a challenge to me, so hopefully we'll get through it all. Um, so yeah, brief background, Daniel mentioned most of it, but currently I'm at Hyatt, there's a data scientist there. Um, really my main goal at Hyatt is to figure out how to personalize customer experiences. So anything from web presence to a customer coming into the hotel, 
Somebody coming in in the morning might be a different type of customer than somebody coming in, checking in later in the afternoon. So how can we really build on the customer experience at Hyatt for each individual guest? Uh, also on the side, do some analytics and instructing of my own and some uh, data science consulting. So things like Tableau, Excel, and SQL are uh, some things I teach on the side. Um, did my master's degree at DePaul, if anybody has questions about that after the program or after the talk today, happy to talk about my uh, experience at DePaul. I was really happy with it. I know we see a Northwestern shirt up here. Um, but really overall, I was really happy with my program at DePaul. And uh, finally, I have some blog stuff um, on GitHub. So a lot of baseball posts up there if you're interested in seeing some more of my work. I will say one disclaimer about my talk today. Most of my work is actually in R. So my dad is sitting in the back of the room, and he introduced me to R before Python. Um, I know this is a Python talk. All the talk today is about Python. Um, all right, so getting into today's talk, I did want to mention the project that I'm going to be talking about today was actually a group competition, a group project at DePaul. So this was for a final senior project in my master's degree. Um, I was really fortunate to be with some really smart people. Uh, Max, I think, speaks like five languages and plays piano. I think Stephanie had two PhDs and a couple of master's degrees. So these were really smart people. Somehow I found a way in with them. Uh, professor Aiku at DePaul, if anybody's come across her, one of the smartest professors I've ever uh, dealt with. She focuses on visual computing. And then Jonathan Gemmel does a lot of consulting around Chicago, so his, may, his name uh, may seem familiar. All right, so getting into today, what the talk's going to focus on, first of all, a little bit of cardiovascular background. This is not medically in-depth, but it is important to cover um, because it's going to be a focus on the talk. We'll do a quick installation of how to install Keras on AWS. I'll show some examples of how to work with medical data. So DICOM data, we'll talk about this later, is really just a medical imaging format with a lot of uh, metadata within one DICOM file. And then finally, we'll do a deep learning tutorial using Keras. So for this tutorial, I'm going to make my presentation all about the Kaggle competition. But for the tutorial, we're actually going to do a demonstration using the uh, Wisconsin breast cancer data set. It's on UCI repository. It's just a little bit more structured data set and a little bit easier to follow uh, for one example. And then finally, I'll talk about some next steps of um, how to take the application we did for this project. What are some other business applications we could actually do with this? So the goal for this project, again, this was the second annual data science competition at Kaggle. So for those that don't know Kaggle, Kaggle's a data science competition website. The last couple of years they've held um, Kaggle Data Science Bowl. This is like the Super Bowl of data science, which is really nerdy. Uh, but this, this competition has some real money at stake. So I think the winner of this competition gets upwards of $150,000, and second place might get about $75,000. So uh, there are teams dedicated full-time to some of these competitions and um, have some real money on the line. So the goal for this project, the goal for this competition is to use patient MRI images to ultimately predict whether or not a patient has heart disease. So doctors, uh, radiologists might spend anywhere upwards of 20 minutes or so just looking at MRI images and this is time away from their patients, uh, that we could be teaching computers how to train and find what's in the MRI image so the radiologist could be spending that actual time with the patient. Um, so how do we do this? Well, uh, first of all, we need to measure what's called the end systolic and end diastolic volumes of the heart. So this is all going to be within the left ventricle of the heart. And based on these values, we can calculate the ejection fraction. So the ejection fraction then is, a, is a, a value that gives a probability to doctors on whether or not a patient has heart disease. So this is all based on the volume of the size of the left ventricle within the heart of an MRI image. And then just for a little bit of vocabulary, diastole is the time period of the heart when in a state of relaxation or expansion. And then systole is the period specifically during which the left ventricle of the heart contracts. So uh, this will be the last medical related slide, but we have the left ventricle of the heart is going to be on, actually on the bottom right portion of all of our MRI images. So we have the right ventricle on the bottom left, 
left ventricle and the bottom right. The left ventricle is the only part that we're focused on for this project. So within one specific heartbeat, the heartbeat's gonna last about two seconds, and the data presented to us is timestamped images of that specific heartbeat. So I'm gonna go ahead and play this video. And we see over this two second period now, the heart squeezes in and opens back up. Now imagine we have roughly 30, uh, 30 timestamped images over that two second period, and those are the images that are now the input to our data set. So this area right here in the middle will be the left ventricle, and this is what we're focused on for uh, this project. So any questions, by the way? All right, so I saw this, um, I saw this, actually had another art talk that I was at, and I didn't necessarily want to copy somebody else's material that they posted, but I thought it was pretty relevant to this talk. So this is a post from XKCD. Uh, it says, this is your machine learning system. Yep, you pour data into this big pile of linear algebra, then collect the answers on the other side. But what if the answers are wrong? Just stir <laughs> the pile until they start looking right. So I thought this was pretty relevant to this talk because uh, first of all, I don't want the intention of this talk to be about learning neural networks. The intention of this talk is about learning how to apply deep learning to our system. So, uh, no, I do not recommend you just take somebody else's code you find online with some neural networks, throw in some random data set, and voila, you have some great results. Uh, it is important, after everything we learned today, it is important that you at least know some basics about neural networks. There are some things that are more important to understand um, otherwise, no, neural networks are not always the best way of going about a model. So, specifically for the data that we'll do the tutorial for, the um, Wisconsin breast cancer data, it's very possible you get a better accuracy using something very simple like a decision tree over some deep learning complicated model. Alright, so how are we going to use deep learning? Well, first of all, deep learning is typically going to be used on GPU. Uh, so I'm a big fan of Amazon Web Services. Amazon is not the only way of going about this, but this is just my personal experience is a lot with uh, AWS, Amazon. So I'm not going to necessarily go through a tutorial because this could be a talk in itself. But um, I could put up these slides later. Here's a great link for setting up a Jupyter Notebook over AWS uh, EC2 system. So if we're within Amazon Web Services, and we go into EC2. EC2 is Elastic Cloud Compute. So basically we're gonna be building a Python machine on an Amazon Web Services machine and using that to run all of our code. So why would we do this? Because our code, or the amount of data we have is so large, we can't use our local CPU for that. So within AWS, I could launch an instance and there's community AMIs on the left-hand side. So we could either go through and create our own machine or we could use machines that other people have already created for us. So if we go through on the left hand side, community AMIs, a community AMI is a machine that other people have created and made publicly available to anybody. So if I were to go here and type in, I'm a, I'm a, personally I'm a fan of Ubuntu machines. So I'll type in Ubuntu Deep Learning. And now here's a whole bunch of Ubuntu Deep Learning machines publicly available with everything I need. It's much easier to install one of these machines than for me to make everything by myself. So if you can't see in the back, you know we have Apache, MXNet, TensorFlow, Cafe, PyTorch, Keras, which we're going to be talking about today. Now these are all pre-installed on the machine. I don't have to go in and install TensorFlow on your own. So if anybody's installed TensorFlow before, it's not necessarily easy to do. Um, all good on sound? So, if anybody wants to experiment, highly recommend going into EC2 uh, using a community AMI rather than trying to build this yourself. If you want to build it yourself, though, it's very possible too. Uh, just could be a little bit more challenging. Additionally, if you're going to be running a GPU, I think it runs anywhere from around two dollars to eight dollars per hour. So, uh, very reasonable if you want to just spend a day or two experimenting. And the result of this, by the way, um, so I put a link for how to install uh, Jupyter onto your machine. This, those machines won't necessarily have Jupyter Notebook installed. Maybe they might, um, some might not, but now we can work on a Jupyter Notebook directly on that Amazon machine 
uh, with all that extra computing power. So DICOM data, getting into, getting into the medical data now. So DICOM data stands for Digital Imaging in Communications and Medicine. This is a standard medical imaging format uh, for, for data. So within one DICOM file, we're going to have roughly 50 variables worth of metadata. So we're going to have things like the patient's name, the patient's ID, the patient's sex. And then in addition to this, what we're concerned about for this project is uh, information about the actual uh, in image itself, so the pixel information about the image. Um, Kaggle provided to us uh, three sets of data, so the training data had roughly 500 patients. At each, uh, for each patient now, we're looking at 17 different slices of the heart. So imagine we have the heart, now take 17 different horizontal slices of the heart, and those are where the MRIs are coming from. Now for each slice, we're also going to have roughly 30 images per heartbeat. So I think in total there's about 500 pa uh, images per patient we're dealing with, which comes out to be about 250,000 images total in our training data set. So this doesn't really seem like a huge number, 250,000 if we were working off a structured data set and had 250,000 rows, we could easily work on that on our local computer. But with the data we're working on, images, that's 250,000 images um, plus 256 by 256 images. So the data becomes really large and uh, is definitely a GPU problem versus doing some deep learning on our CPU. So in our validation data set, uh, around 100,000 images and then 225,000 images in the uh, test set. So Kaggle, some people call it training test validation. Kaggle tends to call it uh, training validation test. Um, finally, the different types of views we had of the heart. So we had a two-chamber heart view, uh, which is something like this will be the two-chamber heart view. Uh, Kaggle also provided to us a four-chamber heart view, but what we're working on is what we call the short axis view, and that again is the 17 different slices horizontally through the heart. And how the MRI gets a horizontal slice midway through the heart, I have no idea. <laughs> All right, so getting into some pre-processing of the data. So, um, again, we're working with image data. So if you've never worked with image data before, basically what an image is is just a bunch of, it's just an array of numbers that make up this image. So in this case, these numbers are just making up images that look like a heart. So typically, when we're going to be using Keras in the first place, we want to put all of our data into NumPy arrays. So... Um, Personally, I'm a fan of working with pandas data frames, but um, in this case, working on NumPy arrays is something that we're going to need to do. We're also going to uh, reshape our images. So these images came to us in roughly the shape of 256 by 256. We're going to want to shrink these images down, down to 64 by 64. So this will allow us to uh, work with slightly less data. So we're losing some information when we shrink our images down, but it will allow us to run our model much faster. And then this is what our input data is going to look like. So for one image, basically we just have an array of numbers. And all these numbers just make up that black and white image of the heart. And then for our training data set, our target variable, we have our customer ID, and then we're going to be predicting our systolic volume and our diastolic volume. So again, these numbers are just pictures of a heart. We're going to use all those numbers to predict what the volumes of the heart are for the systolic volume and the diastolic volume for each patient. So some other potential data preparation steps when doing deep learning. You would want to one-hot encode any categorical data. So one-hot encoding is really easy with the sklearn package uh, with the one-hot encode function. This is turning any categorical data into dummy variables. We'd want to standardize our features so we could center and scale them. Again, really simple with the sklearn. Uh, normalize our data. And then finally, one other thing we uh, thought about doing but didn't actually do was to put up our data on Mechani Amazon Mechanical Turk. 
So for those that don't know, I've actually never used Mechanical Turk before, but uh, for those unfamiliar, you could, my understanding is you could put up instructions for people to do. You could pay them a small fee and people will do that for you. So the idea for our research was to take images of the, um, of the heart, of the MRI, put them up onto Amazon Mechanical Turk and do a demonstration of where our left ventricle is. Ask people to draw a circle around the left ventricle with, instru with uh, instructions We'd pay people a small fee, so maybe you know, a nickel, a dime per image, but they're doing thousands of images. And then we would only use that circled area as the images we're going to now feed into our model. So why would we want to do this? Well, in that case, we're getting rid of all the extra white space that's not important to us. Because all we're focused on, all we want to be focused on for this uh, project is the left ventricle. So this was just one idea of research we had. It's not actually something we ended up doing. There are other, other methods for just getting the middle area of the heart, of the MRI, but running some type of script that just uh, creates a box of our image and uses that would not necessarily be a great idea because it's very possible that our left ventricle was down here, it could be up here, it could be down here. So we wouldn't necessarily want to just take the middle of our image and use that if we're trying to get um, only the important information from our image. Um, but otherwise, Amazon Mechanical Turk is, is uh, great for research if you have um, some type of tedious task and you want to pay people small fee to do for you. <clears throat> Alright, so one other step of the pre-processing is going to be a denoising technique. So I'm going to walk through an example of this on the MRI image, but denoising is going to be a total variation of images, and this is really simple with the OpenCV package, uh, library, and Python. So I'm not an expert on OpenCV, I've used it a couple times, but if you're working with image data, basically everything under the hood is with the OpenCV package. You could do almost anything you could think of. So denoising, as you can see with this image on the left from MNIST, we have the seven with a lot of noise around the image. After we do some denoising, we get rid of all that extra noise, and we can see the seven more clearly. So the one important aspect of this though is that we now lose information about the original image. So over denoising could potentially be a bad thing in this case. In this case it makes the seven much more clear, but it is very possible you over denoise and you lose too much information about your original image. And then finally before getting into some actual uh, Python code, one important aspect of uh, working with images and in a deep learning model is to do some image rotation and shift augmentation. So, you know, just this example of MNIST, uh, you know, it's very possible this five is written perfectly in the middle, but it's very possible the five is written off to the side. It could be written on an angle. So typically you would shift your images between negative 10 and uh, positive 10 degrees, and then also tilt them on an angle between 15 degrees. Those are pretty just standard uh, measurements. And that way, whether your 5 is written like this or your 5 is written like this, your, uh, your algorithm will be able to capture that information. Alright, so let's get into a Python tutorial, um, just showing some actual Python code. So, the packages I'm going to show for this, the libraries, are the DICOM library and PyLab library and Python. So this is going to be very specific to this type of project, but there's a lot of applications with healthcare data. So it doesn't have to be MRI images of hearts. You could be working with MRI images of lungs. It could be for humans. It could be for animals, anything. There are a, a lot of other applications to do this. And then finally, the CV2 package uh, we'll use again. So just loading in the DICOM file now, I could quickly find the pixel array, so I'm basically just loading in the pixel information from my DICOM file, and these are now, this is now an example of what the actual image looks like that we're working off of. So, let me make this a little larger. So in this case, this picture came out pretty good. This is the left ventricle right here. It's pretty easy to find. If every picture like this was like this, we'd probably have no problem, but in reality, the same patient might have another MRI image where the left ventricle is much more blurry. 
or it's much more uh, difficult to see what's going on with that within that area. So this first image was uh, user one, the short axis stack 13, so that's the horizontal slice, and then image one. So within short axis stack 13, we have roughly 30 images. So now for the same user, user one, this is short axis stack 17 now, for whatever reason, the left ventricle is a little bit more blurry down there. There's a lot more noise going on. And then finally, same user, short axis stack five. Now this picture now is completely black. There's a little bit of white space if you come up close. So realistically, not every image is gonna be what we think of as a perfect MRI image. And that's one thing we could potentially have. A computer still might be able to detect some uh, you know, a little bit of noise in the pixels there, but a human might have more difficulty. And then finally, so within this DICOM file, we're going to have a lot of metadata, as I mentioned. So Kaggle anonymized all the data except for the pixel information, but realistically we would have had things like uh, the patient's sex, the patient's age, um, what was the body part examined, the heart, what type of machine was used, what, was the year, uh, what year was the machine built that was used for the MRI image. So this information uh, could get pretty detailed. Ideally, we would have liked to split up our data into uh, males and females, possibly by age. A 50-year-old male is going to be much different than a 20-year-old male. Uh, but because this was all anonymized, we couldn't do anything with this data. So for this project, we were strictly using the MRI images alone. So you can see there's lots of metadata. Um, the image position, um, what, who was the doctor that took the MRI image, a lot gets recorded in here. So finally, using the CV2 pack, uh, OpenCV, as I mentioned earlier, this is just an example of some denoising. So ideally our Deep Learning potentially would have picked up on this for us. Uh, one of the professors involved, uh, Daniela Raiku, her specialty is on image processing. So this was all new material for us. In addition to learning Deep Learning, we were also learning how to do image processing. So it might be a little bit difficult to tell in the back, but here's the original image on the left. And after doing some denoising, we get rid of some of these white little dots in our left ventricle, and we have a much more smoother left ventricle on the right side. So now we can potentially feed in our denoised images to our model and um, hopefully get better results. But ideally, it's possible that we wouldn't need to do this because the deep learning would kind of figure that out for us. Any questions on the denoising? Good question. Yeah. Do you know it's just based on based on the actual like MRI machine like not the noise there or is it just a standard denoising? Standard denoising okay. for this case, yeah. You're saying per machine? Like is it based on the not the machines, the noise in the machine? Oh like uh, yeah, this is just uh, the output of the image uh, denoising on that standard yeah, denoising. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so getting into some actual deep learning now. So for this project, again, there were five people involved in this project, five students with two instructors. We all had different types of roles. So my role for this was mostly focused on uh, using deep learning with Keras. So other people have used other applications, uh, but specifically most of what I'm talking about today is um, work that I had done individually. So Keras is an API wrapper around TensorFlow makes it really simple to run some deep learning models. Um, again, as I mentioned earlier, Keras is not something necessarily used for, you know, if you want to go work at Uber and work on their self-driving car team with their engineers, you probably are not going to be using Keras. You're probably going to be running your own TensorFlow code. But if you want to run deep learning models and do some really cool stuff in a much easier way, then Keras is definitely a great application for you. So Keras, again, is going to be, we're going to want to run this on a GPU machine, but you can install it locally on your CPU. And their uh, website has a lot of great documentation if you want to get more information. 
Um, and it, so in addition, so we're going to be running TensorFlow API wrapper today. You can also run it over Theano and uh, Microsoft's deep learning application uh, algorithm. All right. So again, this talk is not yeah. Oh no. So this talk is not focused on neural networks necessarily, but on the application of neural networks. But with that being said, I'm gonna, you know, just show an example of what a ne neural network looks like. So we have five nodes on the input. So that could be something like five different features you could think of in your data set, five different columns. In this case, we have one hidden layer with different calculations going on between our input layer to our hidden layer. And then we have one output layer. So in this case, we're gonna be working with a binary output. So one or zero. So ignore the medical data now. Um, we're gonna do a tutorial on a, on a much easier data set to kind of follow along. All right, so breast cancer data set, is this a pretty familiar data set people have worked on before? So this is a data set available on UCI. It's a pretty standard data set for learning uh, predictive modeling. So this is assuming now I have TensorFlow uh, and Keras installed on my machine. So we can see I'm just loading in some Keras modules, just two modules to run a whole deep learning model. So my I'm going to import sequential. This is going to allow me to initialize my model. And then I'm going to import what we call dense. And this is going to be my hidden layers. So in addition, I'm working off of NumPy, Pandas, and do some plotting with Matplotlib. All right, so the Wisconsin breast cancer data set looks something like this. So we just have um, you know, one through nine are going to be our features. Column uh, one, index zero is just our user ID, so we're going to take that out of our input. And then finally, uh, over here, 10, we have our target variable. So this is going to be two for benign and four for malignant. So after doing a little bit of data cleaning, I'm just going to change column 10 to zero and one. And then I'm going to uh, just break up my data into testing and training data using scikit-learn uh, train test split function. Alright, so for this example, so for this example, this will be a three-layer neural network. So the input layer is not technically considered a layer. Um, again, we would have three features for the three nodes going into our input. Um, we have four, four nodes in our hidden layer one, four nodes in hidden layer two, and then one output layer. And again, we're working with one output layer because our output is going to be either a zero or a one, depending on whether it's malignant or benign. So for, uh, this, is an, this is what a neural network would look like. For our data set that we're working on, we have nine neurons would go into our input because we have nine features, uh, index one through nine. Sorry, uh, hidden layer one. So we would have nine nodes up here. For hidden layer one, I'm gonna run, uh, use 12 neurons, and this is just an arbitrary number I decided to use. I'm going to run a second hidden layer with eight neurons, and then my output layer is going to use one, one neuron, again, because it's binary output. So to initialize my model with Keras, really simple. We're going to run model equals sequential. This basically just kicks off your neural network, tells Keras you're running a neural network. I'm going to add in my layers now using the dense function. So model data, add dense. So we have 12, we're adding 12 neurons to hidden layer one. We have our input dimension here. How many input dimensions do we have? We have nine features. So we have nine neurons in our input. And then we're gonna use a rectifier activation uh, in our hidden layer one. 
So now I want to add a second hidden layer. Really simple again with Keras. Model.add again. I'm going to use the dense function. This time we want to add eight neurons in our hidden layer two. So I have eight here. And again, we need to tell Keras what kind of activation function we want to use. So we're going to use a rectifier again. So finally, we want to add our last layer in our neural network. So I'm going to run model.add dense one. This is one because we have one neuron in our output layer. Again, binary output. And since we're running a binary output now, our activation function is going to be sigmoid. So we have our ReLU activation on the right, our sigmoid activation for our binary output on the left. And um, the ReLU activation is typically used when you have lots and lots of data. In this case, we're, we have a pretty small data set. Um, but the ReLU uh, is optimized for large data sets. So using Keras, everything is really simple functions in Keras. We could run our model.summary now. Keras gives us a printout of our model. Uh, not necessarily as nice as that uh, picture we uh, had earlier, but this is basically the same thing as the picture shown earlier. So we have 12 input nodes, uh, sorry, 12 nodes in our hidden layer, eight nodes in our hidden layer two, one node in our output, and this shows what types of parameters are going on between the nodes. Uh, we could print out and save our weights using Keras. So we haven't actually gotten to training the model yet. We've only built the model. But um, you know, we could save the final model weights. So now that if we get a brand new data set, we don't need to retrain the whole model. We can just load in our saved weights and run those weights on our new model. Um, we could print our model again. So using Keras, again, we can't make those nice circles with Keras, but Essentially, this is nine inputs, 12 hidden, nine inputs to 12 hidden, 12 hidden to eight hidden, eight hidden to one output layer, one output node. So all of the code that we just walked through, this was you know, five lines of code using Keras functions, and we basically built a really, really simple neural network. So finally, We've built our neural network, now we need to actually train the neural network. So Keras has a function called model.fit. So I originally split up my training and testing data. Our input's gonna be x train, and our uh, target variable is y train. Again, if we wanna split it up within our training, we could do that with the Keras function. We could choose how many epics we wanna have. In this case, I'm running 100 epics. We could choose a batch size. In this case, I don't really need to batch size because the data set is so small. And then verbose one just basically means print all of this stuff. So now we're going to actually be training our model. So we see here we're running epic one of 100. We've got a high loss and a low accuracy of 0.35. So basically, this is because our model just threw in some random parameters. And let's see how well we do with our model, and we'll learn from there. So already, really quickly, we see. Epic 2, we're up at an accuracy now of 50%. If we go down a little bit, Epic 10 of 100, we've already reached 93% accuracy. Uh, let's go down a little more. So Epic 43, we're now at an accuracy of 97%. So our model in this case learned pretty quickly. It wasn't really a difficult data set, um, but realistically you probably aren't going to be learning this quickly with the neural network. So I... I um, my input was 100 epics, so we have epic 100 out of 100 now, and our final accuracy that it reached in our, uh, was 98.8%. It's very possible your accuracy might start decreasing if you're overfitting your model. So again, we could now save our weights, as I mentioned. So if we get a brand new data set of uh, breast cancer data now, we don't need to retrain our model. Training the model could potentially take uh, many hours. We wouldn't want to always retrain the model with new data. So now we can just load in those new weights and uh, input those weights into our new data set. And then finally, I'll just use some matplotlib and print my accuracy. So we could see, in this case, we learned really quickly, um, you know, by epic 25 or 30, most of the learning was already done and basically flatline from there. So, we, so realistically, we wouldn't necessarily want to run this many epics if 
most of our learning was already done here. So this is something to take into consideration though, especially when working with medical data. So it's one thing, um, you know, especially if you're working with medical data, depending on the situation, you want to go for a high accuracy. So if we want to go for the highest possible accuracy, we perhaps want to train our model a little bit longer. But with training our model longer means more time, more computing power, more cost for that computing power. If you don't necessarily care about accuracy, then it's possible you maybe want to stop after around 25, save yourself some time. Um, you know, accuracy isn't always the most important thing. So this is whether deep learning or any type of model, uh, those are some things to take into consideration. So that whole thing was basically, you know, excluding the printing of the images, that was seven or eight lines of code not considering cleaning the data a little bit, uh, just to run all of that neural network. So I'm not going to go into this code, but realistically this is the code that we used for the project. We were dealing with images. For the example we just went over, we weren't working with images. Um, it was just a structured data set, but when working with images there's a lot more uh, what we call pooling and convolutional uh, neural network going on involved. So the code was a little bit more complicated, but I'm not going to pretend I was a master on all this. We were learning this as we went along, so a lot of this was from a tutorial also provided on Kaggle. Yeah? So why did you guys use a convolutional neural net as opposed to other types of neural net? Typically when working with images, you're going to use a convolutional neural net. Okay. And what's the reason for that? Um, so the, the convolution is basically going to go through the image. Um, Basically, I'll go window sliding along the image, and that's just not necessary for working with structured data, uh, that it is necessary for image data. Um, so finally, this was training our model. So one thing I didn't mention earlier, so now getting back to the Kaggle competition, uh, one thing we, we did that as I was putting this together, I realized we probably shouldn't have done, but we took all of our input data and ran it all against our uh, systole volumes. So going back to the beginning, um, so going back to the beginning, now we have our input data, we're predicting against our systolic volumes and our diastolic volumes. We took the whole input, ran a, ran a model against all the systole volumes, and then took the whole input again and ran the model against all the diastole values. So ideally, not every input image is a systolic image, and not every input image is a diastolic value. So image. So had we known better, perhaps we would have split up our images based on whether or not they were systole image or, di or diastole images, and then use those two separate data sets to run against each individual target variable. Um, so this might look a little bit more complicated, but this code pretty much is identical to the tutorial uh, with the breast cancer data we just walked through. We're just running two separate models now. Model, we call it model systole and model diastole dot fit with our input, uh, our input data and our target variable right in here. All right, so finally, the end goal, so we're predicting these volumes, but what do we actually do with that? So for this project, we um, predicted based on the probability density function. So for, for the, uh, the potential volume in the heart is between 0 and 599 milliliters of blood. So an example of a density function here is that probability that the volume is 300 milliliters would be this green area to the left of the red line. So that's what we're doing now for every potential volume of the heart. So as you can see here, so we have probability of the volume is zero, probability of the volume is one, up to the probability that the volume is 599. So in this case, it's um, going to be one in every case because this is the max volume. And graphing each row out individually is going to give you a graph that would look like this. So we can see we have patient 501. This is just user ID. Their diastole predicted volumes, uh, probability, 
and then the 501 systole. So for each patient now, we have two separate values of probabilities we're getting. And then Kaggle, what Kaggle did with this uh, was a lot of Kaggle competitions use what's called a continuously ranked probability score. So this was just another scoring metric that Kaggle uses specifically. This isn't necessarily uh, meant for medical data, but in total, our model took 120 epochs, so 120 iterations, and that took roughly five hours to run. So that doesn't seem like that big of a deal, but the amount of, um, you know, between building the model, training the model, running the model for five hours, coming back and seeing we did something wrong, rerunning the model for seven hours, um, it became a lot of work, a lot of stressful times. I basically had to start my model, go to bed, wake up in the morning, make sure it ran okay, probably made a mistake and rerun it before I went into work. Um, but this is essentially what our um, error came out to be for our model. So we got a Kaggle score of about 0.036. This was you know, middle of the tier. Most of the code we ended up using was from a tutorial anyways, because this was all brand new material to us. But you can see our error decreasing as the number of epics uh, increases. So the graph stops here, but essentially the uh, error would flatline out after 120 iterations. So in this case, we potentially could have kept running our model maybe for seven hours. Our accuracy potentially could have been slightly better, but um, just some things to take into account. All right, so finally, what to do with this. So this was an academic project, um, very academia focused because it was a project for school, but there are real world business applications that you can now do with this. So this project was over a 20 week period. So DePaul's on the quarter system. We worked on this project for over two quarters. As a group, we met uh, once a week and then a lot of outside individual work over those 20 weeks. So had we had more time, these are some, some uh, potential things we would have kept working on. So one idea was to create an image retrieval system for doctors. So given image X, what are the top and most similar images to that input patient? So right here we have our input patient 4. We feed that into our model. We get the results. And now our output is patient 418, 223, etc. cetera. And we could give the... Um, Based on these patients' historical data, we can create some easy table for our uh, doctor, our radiologist to look at for our input patients. So now the doctor, you know, patient four is in the doctor talking to the doctor. The doctor now has all the notes about patients that are similar to patient four. So in this case, um, you know, we can see that we have a 58 year old male, maybe their blood pressure is 140 over 90. He had a heart attack in 2003. That might be important information that our doctor could talk to our patient for. So how are we going to do this? Um, you know, the way an image retrieval system would work, so a simple case, you could think like Google Images. I'm sure they do something much more complex. But we have two feature inputs. So this feature right here is just the array of our image. And we're going to compare that to the array of image two. So we're going to feed in these two images do some type of scoring metric. So this could be, you know, there's a lot of different types of scoring metrics, but cosine, har, et cetera, and we'll get an output value based on how similar those two images are. So you can think down here now, we have patient one, slice one, image one. You could think of this as an array of that image. So this, these numbers are what make up the actual MRI image, and this might be you know, hundreds of, of uh, pixels long. In this case, I'm just showing four as an example. And now we're doing a similarity between every single value against each other. So really quickly, I won't go over all this code, but we wrote a, a function to calculate the mean squared error, as well as comparing the two images. So now as I feed that into my similarity um, calculation, you know, we're looking at image one from uh, user one, user one image one, so we get a similarity measure of 1.0. These are the exact same images here. But if we look at study seven, so user seven image one versus user one image eight, now at the bottom, we can see that these are two separate images from two separate users, but they came out very similar to each other. So we have a similarity measure 
of 0.95. So it's very possible now we could, um, we could use this user's information to make decisions about this patient right here. So it's one thing to give the doctor you know, a table of information. The last thing a doctor probably wants is more data, more time away from what they're already doing. Not that doctors don't have um, the education to you know, analyze more data, but they probably don't want more data uh, just other things that they already have to worry about. So how can we make this easier for doctors? One idea is to create some type of automated text messaging system. We could basically take the results of this table, wrap it up into a couple sentences, give that, se give that paragraph to the doctor, and now they've got the results of a deep learning model, they've got the results of um, you know, the similarity between different patients using an image retrieval system, all bundled up into one single paragraph. So in this case, we'd have something like patient four, John Doe has similarities to patient 418, uh, 223, etc. You know, we could tell the doctor in a sentence, this would be really easy to automate, is given the sentence, it's a pretty general sentence. So three of the five patients John Doe is similar to had heart attacks within three years and have a systolic blood pressure of 140 over 80. So for whatever reason, this might be inf uh, useful information now for the doctor, um, you know, information the doctor didn't have previously. And this is actually something that companies are working on. So not necessarily this application, but uh, you know, this, is a, this is an article from Forbes. So there's a company called Zebra Medical Vision based out of Tel Aviv. Basically they offer MRI scans for $1 using deep learning. So, for every, um, this article was written in October 2017. So for every MRI scan they do using their deep learning model uh, for one dollar, you know, looking back at what I've done now for my projects, it's probably a great business plan because once all of the code is already implemented, all you need to do is feed in new images and everything is pretty much taken care of for you. So, you know, given that the whole aspect of everything has been built out, um, now, now, the more information they get, their models just keep getting better, too. Um, so finally, to wrap things up, so one of my professors that was working on this project, I come into my first class at DePaul, um, you know, this loud professor, cracks jokes, he thinks he's a funny guy, and he told us all not to be data ninjas. So he said, do not be a data ninja coming out of this program. And what he meant by that was, you know, don't be that person that learns how to run a random forest model, but has no idea what a random forest model actually does. Or don't be that person that could run K-nearest neighbors, but you don't even actually know what K-nearest neighbors are. So, you know, with that being said, I would not consider myself an expert on deep learning, but I think what he told us was a very academia-focused way of looking at data science. So. Given what we've learned today, I do think if you spend a little bit of time for a baseline deep learning, baseline neural networks, there are some really cool things you can actually come away with rather than spending you know, 20 weeks mastering it. If you want to go work for Uber, that's great. But if you don't want to go work for Uber, you know, go learn on Coursera some deep learning. Go learn how to apply it using something like Keras, and there's some really cool stuff you can uh, come away with. So I wouldn't say become a data ninja, but maybe just a small one is okay. That's all. Yeah, Daniel. So, so thank you. That was awesome. Um, I'm curious because you kind of pitched this second idea, and and the question came up also about uh, separating the diastolic and the stolic images, um, and. I'm wondering, have you thought about how you can combine a convolutional neural network, which is kind of classically designed for images, with you know, other types of deep learning networks, which might be classically designed for uh, structured data? How can you combine them into one thing where you could simultaneously say, my features include the top patients that you're most similar to and the convolutional neural network feeding in together into one kind of hybrid neural network. Did you kind of think about that or explore that at all? Not necessarily. So the one thing I 
kind of glazed over is that the you know similarity metric stuff at the end was not was actually different technique not using the neural networks. It was basically just comparing the similarity of the images. Um, but with that being said, we could have tightened the information from the neural network with our predictions and basically get collect more information, I guess. Uh, but not specifically, we didn't incorporate that. Yeah? Um, if I can, I want to add one more to your list of recommendations. By the way, I really enjoyed this one. Very nice job. Um, I like learning from books. That's just me. And uh, Manning Publications, of whom I have no connection whatsoever, has two books by the same author. One is Deep Learning with Python. The other is Deep Learning with R. And I'm working through the Deep Learning with R one right now, and it's very, very similar to this. And I was able to follow it just from going through the book, which, you know, was not bad. So if, if this is, you know, like where is this all going? Like? Yeah, like I said, Deep Learning with Python and Deep Learning with R, both published by Python, written by the same person, uh, helped me out a lot. So in addition to, you know, Coursera, you know, uh, Kaggle and stuff like that, there, those options are available. Yeah. Is that Jason Brown? I'm not sure. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah? I'm curious, when you were finding similar images, were you also finding that there was a correlation in the heart disease from all those images, or were you just getting um, So I think for the purposes of this talk, all this data was made up. Oh. So these patients do not necessarily have, yeah. But ideally, we would have had the real data there. We have the back. Right, yeah, so I have a colleague who said that uh, he's had trouble with <coughs> Like really IO balance is hard to get the data to them fast enough. Um, but then I see a lot of people doing it too, so I don't know. I don't know if you're aware. Like, are you aware of benchmarks? Do you know how much that IO is sort of taking you from having these kind of Benchmarks for running a model on GPU versus. Yeah, I know in general the GPUs are way faster, but I've heard that your bottleneck's getting the data to them. Um, yeah. Not any more of a bottleneck than running a CPU instance on AWS, so either way. You're going to have to get the data from your local onto the EZ2 machine. Um, you know, if you know how to move data between machines, it's, it's whether you would know how to, you would need to know how to move data between one machine to another, but it shouldn't be different just because it's a GPU machine. Yeah. Um, in the deep learning with R book, I'm sure also in deep learning with Python, uh, he actually addressed that and said the GPU is five, uh, five to ten times faster than the CPU. So, but that's with the top of the line NVIDIA card and all that kind of stuff. But that's what he said. I haven't had a chance to test it out yet. I don't know. Um, yeah, so I mean, ideally, you know, there's things like Amazon command line interface. You can move data pretty quickly between your local computer. Ideally, that would be good for big data. If you're moving a small data set, you could do something like uh, file Z, uh, WinSCP or Cyberduck, one of those applications, to move data from one computer, from your computer onto a server. Team won the competition and why? No, I'm not sure, but they came away with a lot of money. <laughs> um, there are some cool articles, though. I, I had it read at the time. They, all the results from the winning team were published uh, in articles. Yeah? Okay, um, you, I, I don't know if it's part of the material that you published after this talk, uh, your um, I could post the slides that I had. The actual architecture um, of our specific model would follow something like this. With our, these are all our convolutional layers. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll post the code, but. Um, basically, every one of these model.eds is a different layer we're adding into our network. And again, this is, like, most of this is probably from the tutorial on Kaggle for this competition. Yeah? Uh, another suggestion for this similar to the
Yeah. So uh, on this idea of not being a ninja, but be a ninja sometimes, uh, I think I really appreciate your, your recommendation that you know you have to try it, you have to build it and, and do it in order to, to learn it and to really start to under, dissect it and understand it. Uh, what are some things that you encountered that you learned from some mistakes, because you mentioned some mistakes and stuff, do you kind of recall any of the mistakes that you made that were like, um, oh. Yeah, I mean, at the time, this, this competition, so I, Finished my degree in 2015, December 2015. So we had worked on it uh, over the year of 2015. You know, looking back at what I know now, I wish I could have restarted the project. Um, you know, this was all brand new information really to us at the time. So I've taken some deep learning courses since then. Um, I've gotten much better at using Keras, but you know, at the time this was brand new. We were learning deep learning, learning how to use Keras learning how to install GPU machines, you know, something I could do fairly easy now, but um, it was just a lot of work all over the place. So, just experience, I guess. Okay. Any more questions? All right, well, let's thank Danny one more time, and then people are welcome to...